Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Energy in America here on a given Wednesday. Uh, we are joined by Lou Pugliarisi of EPRINC in Washington. And uh, Lou is going to try to make me feel better about the coronavirus. What do you say, Lou? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can make you feel better. As long as you don't get it, you're going to be fine. <laughs> right on. <laughs> so, uh, Jay, I thought, you know, this is, uh, I'm a little bit outside my lane here, but I do have uh, some, you know, discussion. I think we ought to have a little talk. We have a kind of what the measures we are undertaking is tending to do to uh, energy in America, and how that is a kind of uh, graphic, if you like, a representation of what it's doing more generally to the national economy. Even the tourist trade in Hawaii, you'll see some. We have some data what's happening in the U.S. oil production, what's likely to happen over time. Uh, part of the oil production is also because of the entrance of the Saudis and Russia's, Russia in the price war, but uh, it's happening at a time when we're undergoing rather massive contraction in demand, and this is going to come at a heavy economic cost. And then I think we should have a, you know, discuss a little bit about as I say here, are the measures worth the pain? Or is what we like to say in the public policy community, is the juice worth the squeeze? That's sort of what I'd like us to talk about today. Okay. <laughs> because we're going to go through a big squeeze. Yeah, we are. We're going to go through a process where we're buying ourselves some improved health outcome. And we've had very little discussion on whether what we're exactly we're buying for all the pain. And I know that's a very unemotional way to talk about it. People think about health in a very emotional way, but in fact, it's like everything else in life. It comes with a cost. Well, we're spending trillions. I mean, if you, if you listen to the last press conference or two, we're spending trillions, but not all of that is for health. Some of it is for trying to boost the economy. Right? That's jump change what the government's spending. That's nothing. What we're doing is we're devastating the world economy. Yeah. We're contracting the world economy. Millions of people out of work. Now, if they're out of work for a few months, uh, we, we need to find some way to bridge through. But if we're going to go and actually contract the world economy from, from something anywhere from 5 to 10%, that, much like the coronavirus, comes with a huge cost to society. And uh, I, I would be very uh, surprised if it doesn't also come with a substantial death rate. And I, I actually think this is a kind of hard, uh, hard news. It's difficult for people to kind of get their head around it. I do, this doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything, but I think we should have a much more unemotional and careful discussion of what we're doing to our national economy and the world economy. So that's Let me my... pick back at one thing you said. If, if we have a, yeah. you know, a, a big uh, slide on the global economy, you said that would have uh, its own impact on health and, and create a death rate. Absolutely. Tell me how that data. works. How would that work? So uh, people who lose their job, uh, not just in the U.S., they have bouts of uh, anxiety, depression, uh, the uh, family strife. They, uh, you have suicide, uh, you have uh, lots of health concerns. People are worried they don't have enough money, they don't go to the doctor. I mean, we, we have a lot of models that have looked at this over the years that suggest that if you have uh, sustained periods of low economic activity, high unemployment, you have a health outcome that's quite bad. So the, just on that level, but also making people poor now, that's not a very good outcome either. No, it's a quality of life be, outcome. You know, it's instead of living of at one level, we're, you're living we're, at we're going to be laying off hundreds of thousands of people from uh, the uh, you know tourist business, from restaurants, from uh, uh, lots of traditional economic activities around the United States, and uh, we have a we do have a stimulus package, but it's run by the government. God knows if it's gonna to get to the right people or how much good it's going to do, because in the end, all the productive activity of society has eventually have to 
I mean, traditionally, when we had the when we had the financial meltdown, the concern was bailing out bailing out the banks, but really getting money into the system so product productive productive activity can continue. What we're doing now is saying, oh no, you should stay home. You can't do traditional productive activity. Yeah, so we can dole out a lot of money, but we still need the goods and services to be made. Yeah, that's where the crunch comes. Everybody expects to have uh, at least some semblance of uh, quality of life, but if the whole economy, you know, winds down and is becomes inactive, you won't be able to have those things. You won't have any income and yeah. you won't have any supply line. Yeah, so let's take a look at the uh, at first a couple of a couple of modeling outcomes and uh, see uh, you know compare a very strict quarantine with a somewhat more modest quarantine. Mm. Yes, so let's do that. This is from uh, Rystead Energy, World Meter, plus some other folks out there. So if you look at the U.S. Uh, model results from intense government intervention scenario, what we call a strict uh, quarantine. Now, keep in mind, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the first one you can see here shows what we might expect from uh, in, or the strict quarantine. And this would be very similar to what to happen in China. One of the problems we have in the U.S. is we don't have enough measurement going on. But you can see here, if you look at the kind of light the pink you can see that a big chunk of society gets minor symptoms uh, we have a group that are infected and undiagnosed and then we have this whole group that becomes uh, uh, eventually recovered and uh, undiagnosed okay so that's a smaller group and we're now we're now moving up this you see these little uh, these little bubbles in here. We're now moving up, which we might call the uh, path of the hospital treatment and uh, people who need critical care, right? Now, kind of looking at a time period, running the model from 16th of February to the 1st of July. Mm -hmm. And let's compare that to a, a modest quarantine, right? And so basically, so if you look at the next slide, this is a little, a little different. And so what I want you to understand is the real outcomes that we're facing is, do we take a high intense hit and then get over the hump very quickly, but maybe uh, put a lot of pressure on our hospital system? Or do we delay the number of cases, all right? and we stretch it out over a longer period of time. The interesting probably are not going to substantially change the total number of cases. What we're going to do is shift and delay the cases over a period of time to give the hospitals a more time to deal with it. Flattening the curve. So one of 14 would be would allow a lot more economic activity to take place, um, and uh, would you know would not shut down. You know, if you if you're sick, you stay home. If uh, you are uh, if you if someone in your family has coronavirus, you would stay home. But much of the other activity of society, you know, if you have a cold, you would you check with your doctor. You know, so we, we could do a lot of things, but we wouldn't have this severe shut down all the travel now. Let's go to the next, uh, this impact of this, what's going on right now. And if you go to the next slide. So this shows you, and this is a good marker of uh, world uh, economic activity because global oil and petroleum products, right? They are the kind of uh, liquid that runs the world economy, jet fuel, gasoline, diesel fuel, uh, operation of factories. And you can see these are the components of East Asia, Europe, North America, the rest of our world, and the kind of uh, manage the pandemic. And by this, by the way, 
the pandemic. It's very disturbing to me that they would use this word pandemic. Yeah, the Spanish flu was a pandemic. This is not a pandemic. This is a serious illness. But to call it a pandemic and create all this panic, I think has been very unfortunate. Um, it's it's uh, it's not really uh, it's not really you know I mean it's very well, it's, effective. It's in, it's in something close to a hundred countries in the world, Lou, and it's in every yeah. state of the union, every state in our union. Um, it's pretty yes, much everywhere you look, okay. and there's a number of cases just came up today in Central Africa, which they claim came from Europe and the United States. So I, I think there's no there's no place you can hide. It's it's there. It's everywhere. I Isn't agree that with a that. Pandemic? I agree with that. I'm not saying it's not a bad thing. What I'm trying to say is that compared to, if you look at, for for example, if you look at the Korean data where they've done the most testing, right, the fatality rate uh, for folks under 50 years of age is quite small, right? So it's very much uh, directed, you know, 60 to 69, you have like a 1.3% fatality rate. Above 70, it goes to 5%. Above 80, it goes to 9%. It's bad. It's bad. But why wouldn't that suggest to you that we would have a program that focuses on our uh, senior citizens and tries to, uh, you know, sort of to address them directly than this kind of massive shutdown of the world economy? So, I mean, the question is, from a public policy point of view, would it not have been better to target the interventions where they were needed towards the high risk populations, older people and other people with health conditions? You know, I well, mean, it seems to me that, that? would have been a more targeted We don't approach. know exactly how it's transmitted. We don't have any cure uh, for it and we don't have a vaccine against it. How can we, how can we target and, you know, and, and benefit well, these uh, a subset of the older we don't generation? We could isolate these people, put them in quarantine, protect them, they would, their incidence would be a lot less. It would just be a lot less. Okay, let's go to the, let me just show you a couple of more kind of uh, charts here. So if you look at this chart here, this shows you the number of flights at risk of being suspended in the, this year, 2020. And you can see here, uh, uh, if you show Schengen, which would be the European, right? Mm -hmm. We've had about uh, 1,400,000 flights over the next four weeks. United's down, um, actually, I was quite shocked. There's a lot less than I thought. 20% internationally, Delta 20, 25% international. Singapore, 25% of their total flights. Uh, Air France, KLM are cutting 70 to 90% April and May. Uh, Lufthansa, so you can see, and if you look at the data, 2020 pre-virus was going to be a boom year for the airline business. And you can see right now the actual rate is starting to look like uh, a very, uh, a potentially a very deep dive, which I found was very interesting. Uh, apparently 2018 was a tough year in, uh, until summer. You look here, if you manage the so-called manage the virus uh, scenario will help us to get back some of it, you know, so, but we are going to have a year for the airline business that is going to be substantially below 2017, even in a fairly good case. Now then let's look at uh, what's going to happen to domestic oil and gas production. Now this one, which is the next slide, right? Now, this one is a little more difficult to blame strictly on the coronavirus. Uh, U.S., you can see here as of um, eh, probably production through, now we're about 10, 11 million barrels a day. Uh, this is shale production. So it does include other production in the U.S. But you can see that under different price scenarios, and one of the reasons the price of oil is falling so dramatically is because of all the restrictions on travel and the ongoing price war between the uh, Saudis and the
and get into more detail. But this is probably going to take $100 billion in direct uh, capital investment out of the uh, U.S. economy. Uh, 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 Lou, can we just yeah. take a, a, a short break, come back? Sure. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to get a handle on how this is going to recover, what the elements yeah. are for a recovery, when it happens, and how will we see it, you know, spool up again. Uh, that's Lou yeah. Pugliarisi of EPRINC, Energy Policy Research Foundation. We're talking about energy in America and beyond. We'll be right back. <laughs> Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech and Energy in America. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have uh, Lupo Urisi of Eprink on the on the line uh, from his office or his home in Washington D.C. Um, and we're talking about, um, I guess, the interaction, uh, if you will, of uh, well, everything is connected now. Energy is connected, certainly, with the coronavirus. So we're talking about expectations for both. So, Lou, you had more charts you want to talk about? Give One us a handle on chart. how this is going. Yeah, one last chart. This is really a question of policy. And uh, three, so this, I think three reasons these epidemiological models may be too pessimistic. First, uh, they underestimate the rate of adaptive responses, which should slow, slow down the replication rate. Actually, I saw a couple of very interesting studies today that even showed that uh, the asymmet, the, the people who are, are non, you know, symptomatic, they have the virus, but they don't uh, show it. That the initial evidence suggests that they are uh, less infectious than people with a full-blown disease. Then the models, if you look at the models carefully, they seem to assume that the vulnerability of infection for older people gives some clue as to the rate of spread over the general population when it does not. So that I think that's very important. And then finally, well, what is the lesson of that? What is the lesson that we we so now know about? The, the basic assumption driving these very worst case scenarios, these scenarios which are causing the governments to take very drastic action, is that uh, they assume that the vulnerability of the infection for older population it gives some clue, you know, to the rate of spread over the general population. And, I, you know, the folks I've checked with this, I mean, of course, we're going to learn a lot more. And finally, right, there's a, there's a general assumption in all these models that there's a sort of tacit, but maybe questionable assumption that the strength of the virus remains constant throughout the period when we know uh, the, it's going to, its potency is likely to decline over in, in time particularly because of temperature increases. Now, two or three good studies out there now showing that uh, it is quite clear in a, a, a study by four Chinese scholars that looked at, over the different parts of China and uh, places like Taiwan and Hong Kong are doing relatively well, Singapore, Malaysia, and it's a mixed bag because of course, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Taiwan, they went through the SARS and they were very, very well prepared for this. But also they are areas with warmer climate and there's a lot of evidence that's having the effect. So as we enter in the spring and the summer, I think these models are going to prove to be too pessimistic. And so I guess my feeling is if you're balancing costs and benefits, as we get into the summer months, and as policymakers see, or as we get into the warmer spring, let's just say, I think they should begin to unwind this. Hell, try to get the people to, you know, increase the testing so we know if someone has 
People should wash their hands, of course, do all the other responsible things. Begin to turn the travel back on. Begin to turn the restaurants back on. And get people back to work. That should be, and, and policymakers should start to be giving this message. Look, there's an end game here. This is not the end of the Roman Empire. You know, There is an end game to this thing. And we're going to get to the other side of this. And we're not going to be unreasonable. You know, I always feel that uh, we really want the government to step in and do the right thing. But we should always be careful of turning over our lives to the bureaucrats. <laughs> okay, Amen to that. <laughs> you, know, you know, but the, prob the problem is that somebody has got to call the, the balls and strikes. Somebody's got to say, it, here we are, it, July 1st, and the numbers are going down. Not as many people are getting infected, according to our tests. Hopefully by then we'll have tests. Not as many people are in duress and in, in distress over this. Uh, not as many people are dying. Uh, so, okay, we're, we're, we see the light at the end of the tunnel, and now we can, you know, turn the jets on again. Uh, that's, I guess that's a pun so uh, on the economy. <laughs> yeah, we, <need laughs> and, we can focus on recovering the economy. Let's let's start doing business again. You know, all the businesses that stopped, let's start them up. The, the risk in that, and it's yet to be it's yet to be determined in China. China had these very draconian measures, and and it seemed to stop the contagion and the deaths. I mean, very. I think they had one case yesterday. That's it. Um, but the problem is they're going to send everybody back to work yet. We don't know whether it still lives in there somewhere. And when everybody goes back to work, shoulder to shoulder, you know, we'll have we'll have another epidemic. Well, or, or how serious it will be. This will eventually be like H1N1, like three or four other flu variants we have here there, an endemic piece, an endemic virus, which will mm -hmm. be with us, mm -hmm. for which we will have to develop a vaccine every year as it adapts or whatever to uh, help us uh, address this. And uh, it's part of the flu. It is not the Spanish flu. It's not even SARS or Ebola, but it does have a higher infection rate. I got that. But it also has an enormously positive recovery rate. And all I'm asking for is some weighing of the economic costs when they think about the medical repercussions. That's what I'm asking. Well, I don't, you know, I, but I think the level of, uh, what do you want to call it, concern, I don't want to use the word panic, but concern that presently exists is probably going to get worse because the number of cases are going to get worse when the testing comes through and the number of deaths are going to get So if you look 30, 60 days, we probably have more concern than less. We probably have more draconian methods in this country um, and more, and, and there'll be less business, not more business. And really the question is not only how do we give people confidence, sort of go back to work and concentrate on the recovery instead of staying alive, that's a hard choice. Um, but um, you know, how exactly a recovery will unfold and dangerous business in the, in the uh, Spanish flu, what happened is it, the, the flu developed here. Somehow patient zero was here in, in the Midwest, in Kansas, I think. And it got into a military base and all the guys were going overseas for World War I. They got on troop ships, uh, shoulder to shoulder. They went, they went to uh, France and the like, shoulder to shoulder. And while it diminished in the US, it grew in Europe. And then when the war right. was over, they came back with it and reinfected uh, yeah. the US a year later. But let's put this in perspective, okay? We probably had a half a billion infections with the Spanish flu, according to most of the data. 50 to 100 million deaths worldwide, okay? We, we, we're not even competitive with the flu yet. Okay, I'm not saying we won't be, but we're not even competitive with the flu. True, but we with don't want to be. Every year flu, we want to slow it down. We have 20 to 60,000 deaths of the flu every year in the US. And it's not shown on the ticker tape on CNN every night for two or three hours. Another person died of influenza. We don't see that on the ticker tape. So let me ask you, why are people so concerned about this? Is it completely irrational? It's new, they don't understand it, they have not. It's been all the media talks about. 
little uh, uh, discussion of the target groups, the uh, information and the analysis is still too early for CDC to be very smart about it. Um, the measures the Chinese undertook were quite impressive, but they also were, uh, you know, they can only take place in a very authoritarian regime. And so people, people are afraid, they're sort of panicked because it's an uncertainty they don't know how to judge. But we accept a whole bunch of risks, a whole bunch of risks, which are much more serious than this. We get the, we have a 1% chance, lifetime risk of dying, driving a car. I haven't seen anybody say, look, I'm not going to drive a car because I know it's a lot more risky than the coronavirus, but I'm going to completely change my life because I'm afraid of the coronavirus, right? I think once we get a, 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 better, a better sense that, look, yeah, it's a really bad, it's a, it can be a bad flu, it can be tough to recover from, but that it's really going to be attacking largely the elderly, and we should have a program that focuses on them. Well, I, you know, I'll tell you where this is going to be uh, very, very ironic. And, mm. and that's where, you know, the hospitals are going to be all committed and loaded up with coronavirus virus cases. But the people who have um, the, the old-fashioned, classical, conventional, life-threatening illnesses right now today, the kind we've always mm. had, um, call it heart attacks, call it stroke, mm. call it cancer, whatever that might be, they're not going to have medical care available because the hospital, the hospital, is all loaded up with coronavirus, um, and so they won't have the medical care that they had hoped problem. to get. They're going to be in and trouble. So, uh, you know, they've just brought the USS Comfort into uh, New York, a uh, Navy ship, not to take care of coronavirus, but to take care of everyone else who can't get access to the hospital. There you go. Because of coronavirus. There you go. This thing has like 12 operating rooms, 1,100 beds. I mean, we have resources in this country. We can, we can address. So we only have a Not minute people. left, Lou. I, I just, I, I want to sort of ask you a last question. And um, you can answer it any way you want. How do you really <laughs> feel? How do you really feel about the subject? How do you really feel yeah. about the economy and energy? How do you really feel about public health? Yeah, I, look, I think that these are difficult decisions and trade-offs, but we need to weigh the economic losses. We need to weigh them carefully. You, I, I, you should go out on the street in Honolulu and ask some of the displaced hotel workers how they feel about what's going on now. They think this is the right thing, you know. I mean, I don't, you know, you, there are lots of things we can do to to reduce the risk, and the taking it to zero is very hot. Yeah, it's not a perfect world, that's for sure. It's not a perfect world. And it seems like the more people on the planet, the more complex things get, uh, the more interdependent we are, the yeah. less perfect the world is. <laughs> well, thank you, Lou. There's, okay, my there's so much more coming down the pike. And I'm sure we'll look back at this show in, in, in a few weeks and say, oh, my God, we didn't understand anything. I want to come out to Hawaii. You got warm weather. It's probably killing the coronavirus. <laughs> Thank you, Lou, right. as always. Thank you. Talk Aloha. to you soon. Aloha.